Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi, everyone. This is Jewish Talk coming to you live from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, streaming live on the College Station, the iHeart app, and the iTunes.com. This program is reposted and archived on Spreaker.com. All the things you have to remember. I can't believe it myself. I don't remember it myself. I don't, don't expect you to remember all these things. But don't forget, uh, we are coming to you live from the stage, uh, from the studio, and you can see us on uh, Facebook Live as well. So welcome all of our radio listening audience, and welcome to all of our Facebook family out there. Also, good news to announce that this program has earned the position of being rebroadcast every Sunday evening at 11 p.m. each week. So for those who listen to us in the morning, you can re-hear us in the evening. And those who are listening to us in the evening know that we're here every Sunday morning live at 8.30 a.m. And uh, just in case you don't know, my friends, uh, my name is Rabbi Pearl. And welcome to all the wonderful, to Suzanne Ferenzi, wow, to Gus Savis and to Gene Brandenstein, to Harvey Kipnis, and of course to everybody else, to the Kilshevskis. My goodness, we had a wonderful high holiday season at our Chabad in Mineola. We want to say thank you to everybody who joined us. Chag Sameach from Jonathan Wolf. Guess what, dear friend? Jonathan Wolf is listening to us from New Jersey. Don't tell anybody. We're, we're supposed to be a program focused in, uh, you know, locally here. But here we are. We're reaching out far uh, right across the New Jersey uh, tunnel over there. So welcome, everyone. And um, our, of course... Tonight, my friends, tonight, that is tomorrow and Tuesday, is, of course, the holiday of Sukkot. And an amazing holiday. It lasts for seven days, then it concludes with Shemini Atzeris the following Monday, and then Tuesday is, of course, Simchas Torah. So, um, are we all ready? Our Sukkahs are up. The Sukkahs up at the... At the uh, NYU Winthrop Hospital, for those who may be staying there, for the families... The sukkah's up in our synagogue. The sukkah's up in several homes in Mineola. And uh, let us know how many sukkahs do you have in your community. I can tell you in the Mineola community we have at least one, two, three, four, five, six. Six sukkot, uh, sukkahs in the area. How many do you have in your community? Let me know. You can post it on Facebook Live. And let's see if you can beat us. Because for Mineola... Dear friends, you know, this is the center of everything. We've got six sukkahs coming up. Of course, we have the opportunity to shake the little of an esrig and fulfill the mitzvah. So let's get into this thing. There's a moving story about the holiday of Sukkot, authored by the Israeli Nobel Prize laureate and novelist, uh, Mr. Agnon. He's a good friend of Dr. Kilshevsky's. Jewish law ordains that a Jew acquire an esrig before the holiday of Sukkot and to say a blessing over it each day, except, of course, on the Shabbat. Now, Agnon relates that shortly before Sukkot, in his Jerusalem neighborhood of Talpiot, he ran to one of his neighbors, who was an elderly rabbi from Russia. And he met him at the store selling etrogim. The rabbi told Agnon that since Jewish law regards uniquely special to acquire a very beautiful, aesthetically perfect um, etrog, he was willing to spend a large sum of money, a large sum of money, to uh, to acquire this esrog, notwithstanding, of course, his um, his limited means. So Agnon was surprised. A day later, when the holiday began, the rabbi did not take out his esrog during the service. Right? They came to synagogue, and he saw that the rabbi didn't have his esrog. He says, "What happened? Where's the beautiful esrog that you had?" And the rabbi told the following story. The following story, my friends. I want you to stay with me as we move forward with this. Um, the uh, and I will uh, share with you some of the comments coming in from our wonderful, um, wonderful listening audience as well as our Facebook Live family. So here goes Mr. Agnon says to this rabbi, "What happened to your beautiful etrog?" So he tells him the following story. He said he woke early and he prepared to recite the blessing over the etrog in my sukkah on the on the balcony. As you know, we have a neighbor with a large family, and our balcony is adjoined. And you also know well that our neighbor, the father of these children next door, is unfortunately a man with a short temper. Many times he shouts at them, and I've actually spoken to him many times about his harshness, but doesn't seem to help too much, says the rabbi. 
So he says that that morning, on the first day of Sukkot, he stood on the balcony about to say his, the blessing over his estrog, and he heard a child weeping. It was a little, little girl crying. It was one of the children of our neighbor. I walked over to find out what was wrong. He told me that she had woken very early and gone out on the balcony to examine her father's estrog, which was beautiful, and it was fa- fascinated her. So against her father's instructions, she removed the etrog from the protective box, looked at it, and unfortunately she dropped the etrog into, <laughs> onto the stone floor. You understand when you take an etrog and you drop it on a stone floor, it damages it and you just can't use it anymore for ritual use. And she knew her father would be enraged and punish her severely. Therefore, uh, she was very upset and full of tears. So... This, um, this rabbi said, I comforted her. I then took my etrog and placed it in her father's box, taking the damaged etrog to my premises. I told her to tell her father that his neighbor insisted to accept the gift of this beautiful, beautiful etrog and he would be honoring me and the holiday by doing so. Now, Agnon, who tells the story, says, my rabbinic, my rabbinic, uh, my, my neighbor, the rabbi, he had a very damaged richly unused etrog but as far as the beauty of the the etrog there was the most beautiful etrog he'd ever seen in my life what do i i love this story because in a gentle way it reminds us how we should all behave ourselves right this man gave up his beautiful etrog to help somebody else and that's a very powerful thing um we are summoned to build a society out of our holy lives and generous deeds. But along with being religious is being sensitive. So along with kindness, that stands at the very core of our Jewish values. Judaism is not just a faith of sacred moments set apart from daily life. It's a religion that is, it should infuse the texture of our every life, every day of our life, of our daily needs, our words and our relationship as well. You see, the world is overwhelmingly rich. Human imagination is incapable of paying attention to all of the facets. The artist sees the world in color, the sculpture sees it in form, the musician sees the world in sounds, and the industrialist sees it in terms of commodities. The psalmist sees the world in terms of an arena of kindness, compassion, righteousness. Therefore, to be, to be a person, to be a mensch, is to be sensitive to the poverty and the distress and the loneliness of others as well. Let me tell you this. I'm going to tell you a little story about Bertram Russell. But first, let me say hello to uh, Jonathan Wolf, who thinks that our our uh, lessons reach into the heavens. Thank you, John, uh, Jonathan. And Suzanne Ferenzi is in Florida. Oh, my goodness. And she wishes all of us well. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach to the Kilshevskis. And uh, hello, uh, Richard Dollinger. And... Uh, all kinds of good things here. Michael Greenberg has joined us. Louis Pushkin has joined us. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, it is a very beautiful thought. And Franklin Sermon has joined us. I want to say everybody. Let's go back to this, though. Being the idea of combining being a mensch, right? Doing the right thing, but at the same time, being a mensch as well. So the story is told about Bertram Russell. He was in the habit of, of punctuating his lectures with, ir- with ironic and sarcastic remarks. This practice often uh, offended the students in his class. They see, we having a class on ethics who wanted to know how this teacher of ethics could be so cynical. He says, I became a great scholar, but I did not live morally. He says, that, that, that he said, as, as a grobe jung, even though he is a great scholar. He says, Russell says to ask one of the students, what else are you studying? The student says, I'm studying mathematics. So Russell says, then why don't you ask your mathematics professor why he isn't a triangle or a trapezoid? You know, why doesn't he uh, be that way? The professor shrewdly illustrated that if ethics obligates the ethicist to be an ethical person, mathematics should obligate the mathematician to be a geometric figure. By sharp contrast, in our world... God insists that godly truths are embodied precisely in what a kind of person we become. You see? The Talmud asks, which is greater, Talmud, studying, or action, learning, or deed? 
And the answer is, learning is greater because it leads to deed. Knowledge, then, is not an end in itself, but a path to transform one's character. Therefore, learning, living properly, is tested not by passing exams, but by how I live. If I become a great scholar, but I do not live morally, then my education may have been academically successful, but as far as my uh, moral standards, my Jew- I would be a Jewish failure. You see, Jewish education is not about abstract contemplation of the truth. It's about living a moral and holy and living edu- a life of Jewish education. When the Torah speaks about education, it does so in a, in a striking way. It does not speak as do the great Greek thinkers Plato and Aristotle of the search for knowledge and the quest for truth. It speaks of teaching children how to become ethically and spiritually. Abraham, our forefathers chosen, why? The Torah tells us, so he will instruct his children and his household after him to keep the ways of God and by doing righteousness and justice. So going back to that story, when Agnon saw this great rabbi, an older rabbi who came from Russia, which means he came from a period of time where he didn't have a chance to fulfill the mitzvahs properly with all the Soviet Union and all the anti-religious activities there. So he comes to Israel, but he gives away his beautiful esrog because he saw the girl next door crying and knew the uh, what would be the outcome with the rotten father that she had. So Jewish education is not about abstract contemplation of truth. It's about moral and holy living. In fact, Maimonides, the great Maimonides, explains that gracious and holy living is a general theme in Judaism. The Torah says, Valachta bedrach, you should go in his ways. We should all walk in God's ways. And Maimonides explains, we are commanded to develop certain traits of character, to be gracious, to be merciful and holy, as God is gracious, merciful and holy. Meaning, in addition to prescribing uh, or forbidding specific actions, Judaism requires us to develop certain virtues of the heart. Judaism is more than choreography of the behavior. Torah is concerned not only with our conduct, but also with our character. Not just with mitzvahs we do, but also the kind of person we become. There are people who are, who are successful, intelligent, influential, but there are also people who, who Torah has, has transformed. And you can tell them by their demeanor, their way of relating to people. They bring pride and honor to Judaism, like the rabbi who gave his esrog away to this vulnerable child. For the goal of Judaism is for man to be an embodiment of what Torah is. For Torah to be in man, in his soul, and in his deeds. So here we are, preparing ourselves for the great holiday, this whirlwind of the great holiday of Sukkot. On Sukkot, we move out of the house into a hut, We parade around the synagogue with palm branches and citrons. In the times of the temple, a special water libation was performed as everybody sang and danced, and we are commanded to rejoice. But what on earth is this all about? What on earth is it all about? So in outlining the foundations of the sukkah, we come across contradictions. For one thing, the sukkah is meant to be permanent, yet transitory. There's a transitory aspect to it. Why? Why? Let me explain. The sukkah walls can be built from any material, as long as it's sturdy enough to stand up to the average wind. Therefore, it has a sense of permanence. Yet the branch covering this, it's called the schach, is basically a disorganized bramble of uprooted vegetation, palm branches, bamboo sticks, corn stalks, clippings from your front yard. Chaotic. Without tying the branches in in an organized fashion, we throw the stuff over the top of the schach. The beams holding up the schach must be of natural origin, such as wood. That's why you have these wood two-by-fours across the, the, uh, the, the, the roof of the sukkah. And let, let it form the roof, if you can call it that. So this roof must provide more shade than sunlight at the height of the day, yet allow us to see some stars at night. So either way, um, Club Med or Magic Frog or Fog, we thank God for sustaining us remind ourselves how God watched over us in the desert. So this top part of the structure makes our sukkah transitory. It's like it's not a permanent. You get the feel that when the strong unexpected gust takes your branches for a ride, you know, you realize that uh, your your roof is not exactly so permanent. So why do we sit in this kind of permanent, insisting on the wall should be far more stronger 
a sense of permanency, yet the roof is, has a transitory kind of it. And there are several answers given to this. And you, suit, you see which one you would like.